everybody, welcome along to the history program with the Limerick Historical Society. And as usual, uh, I have Tom Donovan, my, my co-presenter with me uh, today. And today we have another different subject again, completely from what we would normally do, but it's history. And I'd like to welcome along uh, Pat Gill. Pat, you're very welcome to the program. Thanks, Tony. And we're going to talk about which, which Pat, I've, I interviewed you on the radio. God, it must be 15, 18 years ago now. It's uh, on the good old RLO station. And then you gave a talk to the Historical Society. And what we're going to talk about today is Opus Dei. Who it is, what it is, the founding of it, and why it was founded. And uh, a lot of people, uh, I'm sure out there, majority of people have heard of Opus Dei. It has got good press, bad press, and uh, uh, we, we go through all those, you know. But first of all, what is Opus Dei? Well, Opus Dei, it's a part of the Catholic Church, and its message is that in everyday work, in family activities, uh, in all ordinary life, uh, there's an occasion there to have a spiritual union with Jesus Christ. And uh, Opus Dei helps people to do that, and it gives them the I suppose the encouragement and uh, the uh, pastoral care that they need to to make a go of that in their lives and to find Christ in their lives. And it was founded by Saint Jose Maria Escriva in 1928. So we're coming up in uh, six years time, or six to seven years time, to our centenary. Uh, which was a great occasion. And um, it started in Ireland in 1947 uh, when the first member of Opus Dei arrived here to do um, studies and to work as an engineer. And uh, there's, there are centres now around the country in uh, Dublin, Galway, Limerick, Cork and Belfast. And members of Opus Dei scattered uh, Beyond that, um, the majority of our members are, are married and they um, make the effort to find holiness in their in married life. Um, the Second Vatican Council actually took up this message uh, very clearly that everybody who is baptized uh, has the, the duty, the responsibility to uh, you know, reach the heights of holiness in their life. And, uh, so Opus Dei is trying to do that specifically with uh, helping people who are lay people and are in sort of working and in, in involved in ordinary everyday activity to do it in that context. That's the... Could, could I ask you, first of all, yeah. was it, was it really a, a, what was his, how would I put it to you, where did this idea come from? Why did he think this was needed? Do you know? Yeah. A, I was. I. I don't I mean. I think things in my head now will do this. Uh, but where did he get this thinking from? In the twenties. Yes. Well, um, he was very clear that it wasn't a particular uh, problem in the nineteen twenties that he was trying to solve. He he saw it as um, the will of God, as as a message from God to uh, start Opus Dei to promote holiness for lay people and contemplation in the middle of everyday uh, life. And uh, so in that sense, and, and the, the title of Opus Dei, it's work of God. So he always referred it as something that God was doing, that he was just an instrument in God's hands um, to uh, bring it about. And he devoted himself entirely to that. He, he was very clear as well that it it became clear to him on the 2nd of October, 1928. He was in the middle of a, a retreat. Um, diocesan priests do a retreat once a year. And he was he was doing that in a, a retreat house in Madrid. And it was in the middle of that retreat that he was going through some notes in his room. And uh, he, he, you know, what he, he had been asking God to show him because he had a sense from the age of 15 that God wanted him to do something with his life. Uh, he wasn't sure what he, he became a priest to be available to that. Um, he was ordained in 1925 and it was um, three years later then in Madrid that on that 
particular day that it, uh, it came home to him what it was that God was asking him to do. And he always referred it in that sense uh, to himself as an instrument um, uh, and as making the effort then to go about uh, the task, uh, the mission and the insight uh, that God had asked him to do. And to what, 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 was the reaction, what was the reaction within the church when he brought forward this uh, idea? Well, uh, he had great support from uh, the Archbishop of Madrid to start off with. Okay. Um, and then he went to Rome uh, in 1946, uh, and Pope Pius XII granted the, the first... Well, actually, earlier than that, his, his um, successor, uh, Blessed Alvaro del Portillo, went to Rome in 1943 to obtain... Uh, approval for the ordination of the first priests uh, in Opus Dei, including himself. Um, so Pope Pius, all the popes, like Pope Pius XII, gave the initial approval. Um, and uh, Opus Dei has always acted with um, the approval of the ecclesiastical authorities in the church. And um, uh, so he, you know, he was very conscientious in that regard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but, uh, was there any adverse reaction within the church? Um, well, I suppose uh, it's it's um, you know it's a matter of historical record, sure. Um, that um, the 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 idea of lay people seeking the fullness of sanctity in in the middle mm -hmm. of their ordinary occupations, you know, uh, is something that had been to a large extent forgotten. Uh, people didn't know what that looked like. I mean, the early Christians were certainly yeah. on this message. And when they became Christians, it, it meant a lot in their life. Uh, it didn't mean that they left the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it was, there was a certain um, novelty about what St. Josemaria was, was preaching and was, and, uh, and what would emerge in terms of people who were doing this and being good examples of this, many of whom their, their causes of um, beatification and canonization are underway. Uh, yeah. And uh, that that took, you know, that has taken some time. And remember, this was 1928, so it's the Second Vatican Council still hadn't taken yeah. place where a lot of these ideas about the importance of the laity and the holiness of lay people became a mainstream in, in the, the church's understanding of its mission and the role of and lay how, people. How long was Jose Maria leader? Up to his death on the 26th of June, 1975. Um, oh, he, he died in Rome in 1975. And, yeah. um, uh, he was um, beatified in 1992 and canonized in 2002. Um, yeah. And his successor, in fact, the last, uh, the time, Tony, that I was on your program was around the time of his centenary and canonization in 2002. Yeah. And the last time I was speaking to the Historical Society was uh, around the time of Blessed Alvaro's beatification. And since since then, in 2019, uh, the first lay person of Opus Dei has been beatified, uh, a woman uh, by the name of uh, Guadalupe, Guadalupe Ortiz de Landasui. Mm. Uh, she had a PhD in chemistry. She um, taught uh, chemistry uh, in an institute, but she also devoted time to starting um, women's activities in Opus Dei in Mexico. Um, and... Um, Actually, she died only um, a few days uh, in the month after St. Rosemaria in July of 1975. Yeah. Um, was, 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 was uh, Father uh, St. Jose, was, was he a member of an order? Or was he secular, you know, as a, as a priest? Was he a he member was, of the Franciscan Dominicans, uh, you know? He was a diocesan priest, Tony. Um, yeah. He was ordained in uh, Saragossa. And he, he wanted to do um, a doctorate and the only place he could go for that was in Madrid. So he, he went from Saragossa to Madrid to, to do his doctorate uh, in the university there. And, um, uh, and it was while he was there, he had this, uh, he, the, you know, God showed him, if you like, what, uh, what his plan was. And he, 
began working on that straight away. And that, of course, um, took over his um, his whole life uh, from there on, you know. Mm -hmm. so, I, 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 I've never heard of this. Sorry, Tom. Sorry, Tom. Go, 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 go ahead, Tom. Okay. Yeah. No, but I'm just saying this. I had never heard of Opus Day going up, let's say, right? I mean, I'm mean, I, 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 a practicing Catholic. I would consider myself. And, you know, and I like that. I'd never heard of Opus Day till I was asked one night to go to a meeting out in the old, what was the old Ardu Hotel. And I remember going into the room and I'd never heard of, of Opus Day. What it was, who it was, was it a personal, was it a... And the first thing that comes to mind is a secret organization. That's what I had in my head was, uh, why, how would I put it, Joe? Why do you think that is, that it's kind of got this kind of, um, I suppose, and for me now, I'm saying this, as a secret organization. What's, I mean, how did this come about? Well, I suppose um, <coughs> as when, you, when you're, you know, as a lay person, you, the, the, the key thing about members of Obus Day is they're, they're not distinguished by any uh, change, you know, by being in Obus Day, it's, it's your personal spiritual life, you know, so it's, you don't wear any gear or you don't, uh, you don't stand out in that sense. Uh, if you do stand out, it's because you are trying to um, give witness to your faith and to treating people with charity and all the other virtues. Um, Opus Dei came to Limerick, I think around 1984. Now there had been some activities before that, but our, our first center, this house that I'm in here in Castle Troy, uh, was around 1984. Uh, I myself met Opus Dei in Galway, and in my family, my, my father's, my late father's first cousin, Father Oliver Pole, who's actually quite ill at the moment, you might remember him in your prayers, um, he uh, was one of the pioneering members of Opus Dei in Galway, and they set up a centre, and I went around there, there was a youth club in operation there, and that's how I first um, met Opus Dei. So I think Part of it is uh, you have to meet people uh, to hear about it, but also nowadays um, the internet, uh, which maybe wasn't there uh, when we were growing up, uh, is uh, also another uh, source of reaching out to people. And um, our website, uh, opusday.ie, has a lot of information and um, uh, it has grown, I suppose, in functionality, especially during the lockdown. Uh, a lot of our activities had to be translated to online activities. Mm -hmm. This gave an opportunity to a wider audience to experience um, retreats online, re evenings of recollection online, uh, talks on matters of um, interest to do with the faith or the history. Well, of the I think, I think personally myself, one of the you can use promoter. One of the best promoters was Pope uh, was John Paul II when he was Pope. He, to me anyway, he was a big believer. Well, we know he was a big believer in Jose Maria, and he kind of, what would I say, kind of made it more uh, accessible to people. People looked up with, oh, if he's one, kind of, it doesn't seem any harm if the Pope, if the Pope was a member, you know, and that kind of brought us out into the open. But tell me this. You do accept, there are other organizations which we all know about that don't accept women, for example. But Opus Dei do, as you mentioned, that, that, that other thing now in Mexico, that they, they accept women. So how do you, how do you make, how do you get women to join as opposed to um, for men? Or, you know, is there any difference or different levels of women? Well, um, to join Opus Dei, a person has to have um, a sense that it's a vocation, that God is calling them to this particular path of holiness in the church. There are many paths of holiness in the church, very venerable. And, um, you know, it wouldn't be a Catholic has to respect, you know, all the pathways of holiness that are there in the church. Uh, so the particular calling uh, to somebody to be a member of Obus Dei is, is a, it's a personal vocational call. Um, Pope Francis, on the, after the Synod on, on Youth a number of years ago, uh, produced a lovely document on discernment of vocation. Uh, and he described how there are two 
parallel processes. There's the personal discernment and then there's the ecclesiastical discernment, the ecclesial discernment where um, somebody, you know, who um, has to see for themselves that this is what God is calling them to do. And then also Opus Dei, like all the other institutions in the church, also have to uh, decide whether it's prudent for somebody, whether there are uh, whether it's just a fit of enthusiasm or whatever. So um, it's, there's a, there's a, and that's the same for men or for women. Um, uh, Is there... of, of membership, let's say that's the same, but okay. largely the, the people who, people who come to activities that we offer in Opus Dei, um, you know, they're not uh, in the membership category. They're, they find our, our, uh, pastoral care or their or our ideas about holiness they find that very attractive and think they get a lot out of that and um so that's and pat, pat is there a hierarchical, hierarchical structure in, in opus day like i mean is there you know different layers or priest. like you know you have priest parish yeah. priest bishop well, um, in Op Opus Dei is part of the hierarchical structure of the church. It's an institution yeah. of the church, a, a way yeah. that the church has of organizing itself. So there's a prelate in Rome, um, and he is the uh, the person with authority uh, in the prelature. It's uh, Opus Dei within the church is referred to as a prelature. Is he a successor of Jose Maria, or is he? Well, he's elected. We elect our we elect our prelates, so he's the first. Oh, yeah. uh, Sorry, he's the fourth. Uh, Saint Rosemary was succeeded by Blessed Alvaro del Portillo. Yeah. He uh, Blessed Alvaro died in 1994. He was beatified in 2014, and then his successor uh, Javier Echeverria uh, died in 2016. And the current prelate uh, Fernando Carith, Monsignor Fernando Carith, he was elected in January 2017. And he visit our, the first country he visited after his election was Ireland. He was here for a few oh. weeks. During yeah. Easter, um, and um, he hasn't. He's been. He's been. We've been able to tune into um, his mass for um, uh, Good Friday uh, or for Holy Thursday and things like that on the web uh, during the lockdown. But this mm -hmm. summer, he ha he was able to um, was able to ordain uh, twenty seven priests there in May, and uh, uh, he has visited a number of places uh, around Central Europe. Uh, during the summer so and you you'll see as well and i mean most of this is on there are videos of it on our web page and all that you'll see how um well we we try to tune into his messages and they're also available on the web um mm. and so in each country then where opus day is present uh, he would have a vicar uh, so uh, the vicar is the representative of the prelate in the country with his authority who also relates to the local bishops and keeps them informed of all that's going on. And, um, and there are uh, advisory uh, councils then at the, in Rome and in each of the countries as well, a, a regional board uh, who help the vicars and who help the, uh, the prelate in the governance. So there's a sort of a central governance and a regional governance, uh, and then a local governance each, each, um, Center of Oversight would have a local management committee, uh, and each level would have its own sphere of, I suppose, authority. Um, and uh, at the local level, we're mostly just, you know, what day will we have the recollection, or when are we going to start the, when are we going to go on a trip with young people again, or what are we going to provide during the lockdown? Uh, local activity would be sort of and the main thing we try to do and again following the spirit of our founder is to make decisions in a collaborative way collegial way so that we listen to the opinions of others and try and uh, uh, put that you know make a, a yeah. collegial decision so sometimes you might feel well that's not the best decision but at least it's the agreed one so um yeah. Tony mentioned there that you know the perception of being secret, but there's always a, there's also a perception of it in on the conservative side of the church. Some might say right wing, maybe, but you know, do you think that's the fair criticism or uh, you know of Opus Dei? Yeah. Um, well, within the church, uh, Opus Dei is uh, always on the side of the Pope. 
and of yeah. Yeah. teaching of the church. And um, uh, so uh, the question of whether you're conservative or liberal is, is to try and maybe label people. And yeah. you follow Pope Francis and how he's encouraging us to, you know, reach out and reach beyond uh, mindsets about any particular block of people or yeah, yeah, yeah. talk about the peripheries, for example. Now, yeah. you immediately think of social peripheries, which is certainly the case and uh, which is very important uh, mm. work, but also there are cultural and intellectual peripheries where, you know, Christ has been, you know, people have lost the experience of Christian living or they haven't really encountered Christ. And, um, you know, those are peripheries that we want to reach out to. And um, uh, so it, it's, uh, if anything in Opus Dei, one is encouraged to, to, to make friends with people, whether they're conservative or liberal as, as, as referred to them and uh, not to, uh, obviously to engage with people and to be, obviously one is clear, try to be clear about uh, what you believe in, but to communicate that in a, not in a, as, as trying to win an argument as Pope Francis said, yeah. enjoy the gospel, but as trying to persuade people about the beauty of, um, of Christian life. I mean, today's gospel acclamation about Christ as the way, the truth and the life I think is um, something that you know needs people need to see what that looks like and to hear it mm. and experience yeah. it and uh, and they need that because um, I think right. what what is certainly clear in today's society is there is a growing secularization and as Pope yeah. Hendrick, as Pope Hendrick said about that you know you're robbing people of their greatness because if the here and now you know is the only thing that that matters um then the idea of growth in you know in the love of god and virtue uh that can make you you know help you to be a better person uh well it robs you of that you know? um so it's our virtue is, is yes we're faithful to the church but you know we, we're we're open and friendly and want to engage with everybody with yeah. it's good to come to now Two questions. First of all, have you have you personally got a position like are you the the, the vicar general of the of the, the, the something within the organization? And two, how does one actually you don't have to join a sort, you know, funny handshakes or anything, or you know, how does one join up? In other words, if I have a calling for Opus Day, right, and I'm interested in a read up, how does one who do I approach to get involved? If somebody is out there watching us and they want to get involved, what do you do? Okay, well, um, the first question, my position is director of Castleville Study Centre here in Limerick. Um, so uh, it's um, just, uh, and I'm helped by an assistant director and we have a priest here as well. So, so that there's some kind of, collegial framework over how we run the center and how we run our activities. That's the local arrangement. Um, I, uh, and that's uh, an unpaid part-time or, you know, voluntary post, et cetera. Um, these kind of positions are like burdens that certain members of Opus Day take on so that the overall um, apostolate, while it's directed and unified at the same time, it's completely, um, people are free and they do a lot of people's apostolate is, is you, you couldn't put your finger on it because it's just the way they cope with difficulties in their life at home uh, in their families and as regards uh, coming in touch with Opus Dei a lot of people uh, just on the internet you can send an inquiry find out where's the local center what's going on uh, or just get material to read or follow online um, and uh, or you might get a contact. I mean, I, I receive those sort of uh, information requests from time to time here. Um, and then our activities are, um, so for example, um, during the lockdown, one of the activities that uh, actually prospered uh, more than it had in real time was our uh, family enrichment program. And this is a program for um, couples and they were doing 
case studies to help them on the whole area of married love. And, uh, and it was possible, you know, for I think it was something around 30 couples to come together in, in small groups and in bigger groups to study cases and discuss them online. And uh, it would be very hard to organize that because they were from around uh, different parts of the country. Um, and, you know, some of that would have been uh, people mentioning it to other people. I mentioned it to some colleagues and friends of mine. Um, uh, I, I don't think I had much success, actually. <laughs> but that was that was an effort to um, offer people something I thought would help them. Um, and uh, other activities I'm involved in are uh, to do with promoting relationships. So father, we have a father and son club. Um, again, we had to do things online during the lockdown. So we had father, whereby fathers and their sons would uh, work together on something, spend time together doing something, making, for example, making a, a car out of recycled materials, uh, a model car, I mean. Um, or uh, building a musical instrument out of recycled materials um, or just quizzes or that. And then along with that, we would offer um, a talk uh, perhaps on something like how to be, how to manage money, how to be an honest person. Uh, would you, would you, at these meetings now, for example, is there a set time for, let's say something like, like the rosary or do you just pray or is this, Organized prayer, if you know what I mean. Do you say, now it's time for the rosary? Or what way do you pray at that, at those meetings? Okay, well, it depends. Obviously, if you're running a, a specifically spiritual activity. So, for example, we have retreats, which are very structured around the mass, the rosary, talks from the priest, and talks from a lay person, time for reading and reflection, the way of the cross. Um, I think the least ever attendance we had on during the lockdown was on our Good Friday recollection here. Uh, we had 120 connections. Uh, now, they weren't all on at the same time because our, our Zoom account was 100. At, uh, there, were, there were 120 people tuned into different parts of it. So that's very specific and you know what you're coming for. In, in our father and son club or in family enrichment, it's open to non-Catholics as well. So there isn't a specific uh, devotional part to that. But if there's a talk about the, you know, the, in that situation, I suppose people's framework and their ethos comes across and the, the, the values that are communicated um, will reflect um, a Christian outlook on life. Um, so that's why, for example, in the fathers and sons, uh, the idea of um, virtues, you know, good habits, that you can build up good habits and that these are important. What do you think, Tom? I just wondering there about, you know, the church has, how, how does the Upstay fund itself? You know, you have, you have a, I remember from the lecture, you have a magnificent centre in, um, down in Utah, is it, or, or some part in the southern states? In America? Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I don't know if it's anything in Utah, but certainly in Texas and... Oh, Texas, yeah. Uh, Texas. Right, you know, different parts of the states, there are yeah. some wonderful places. No, but, I mean, uh, where, where, what's the... We have, a lovely, we have a lovely conference centre in County Mead. I was involved in the design of it. Um, All right, yeah. And, uh, my, I mentioned my beloved uh, cousin once removed, Father Oliver. Yeah. Earlier. Yeah. He actually sourced the, um, the cut stone uh, backdrop for the oratory, which was coming out of a, a convent that was closing down in England. Oh, right. we, we were delighted to get it. Um, and that's a centre that um, we had to fundraise for. Uh, and we had, uh, uh, and you know, uh, at one stage, you know, it might have been a, a pipe dream that some big benefactor would come along and pay yeah. for the whole thing, you see. But in yeah. fact, uh, it, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. What happened was we had to go around and ask our friends and uh, get help. And I think we did these evenings of presentation, not unlike the one that you were at, Tony. And I think somebody taught it up that about 5,000 people had come to hear about Liz Mullen. Uh, Liz Mullen is the name of the, the centre. And um, that, you know, that was much better. Because, where, is, where is the centre? Where is it near? Uh, it's near the hill of Tara in County Meath. It's just across, down the hill and across the road. And there's a, pro, it, you'll see on its website, there's a programme of, okay, now this couldn't happen during the lockdown, but in the normal course of events, there are programmes of retreats, courses. Um, there's a, a very 
um, popular farming seminar actually because it's located in farmland areas in County Meath and Woodlands. There's also a business leaders forum that takes place there because the idea, and th those again are less, you might say, spiritual, but at the same time, they have this notion of uh, ethics or family values in farming or in ethics and business that influence and uh, explain, if you like, why they're, why they're happening. And some people who come to those see Liz Mullen and they're very impressed with it. And, and they, uh, but to go back to the question, I mean, um, I myself have a commitment, which is like having a wife and children. So I, mm -hmm. I put my uh, tuppence halfpenny in to help keep the show on the road. And then yeah. we, when we fundraise for our activities and for our centres, and obviously where possible for youth work, certainly we try to get um, grant assistance where that's possible. Um, and there are youth club grants from the ETB in Limerick. I was successful in, in getting... Uh, 700 euro recently for that uh, from the ETB here. And, uh, but we're, we're in, when we're fundraising, we're not fundraising for ourselves personally, but for the yeah, centers yeah. and the places that are doing it. And on a worldwide basis, um, so for example, uh, we have a foundation called Haram Bay, which is for the activities in Africa, the um, hospitals and the rural development activities that are taking place uh, in Africa. And, uh, and there will be similar efforts. Uh, we have fundraising for the training of priests in Rome. Uh, we have a pontifical university in Rome where priests from, especially from third world countries who can't afford the fees and that get yeah. uh, bursaries. Uh, so, um, and we have on our centers, uh, you know, we have uh, generally we have substantial debts. Fortunately, we paid off the Les Mullen debt right. some years ago. Um, and the struggle now is to make ends meet because the, yeah. one has, the lockdown has been a severe blow to... Yeah, yeah. But and like, if, if supposing you, you get a new person coming in they want to join, uh, the, you know, like Tony and I don't drink or smoke. Do we have a head start? Or like, can you... Are you is part of personal discipline that you wouldn't uh, take alcohol or cigarettes or, uh, or do you have to make would you would you be would there be a suggested contribution if you were earning money would you pay so much into the, the church or to the opus day yeah okay uh, i'll start with the drinking and smoking yeah um, saint Jose Maria actually asked blessed alvaro to smoke at a certain stage because he wanted people to feel free about smoking he had a great yeah. love for freedom and it, it wasn't yeah. uh, it wasn't prohibited by the church to smoke, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nor is it prohibited by the church to drink. I mean, our Lord changed the water into wine at, at Cain, yeah. and many people see that as a an implicit, um, you know, uh, approval yeah. of alcohol, which of course is a good thing. Obviously, uh, one you know, temperance is a virtue, and it's one of the virtues that uh, sorely needed. Um, uh, and the fashions with smoking have changed completely, so yeah. uh, you won't. Uh, I think it's against the law for us now to have anyone smoking in our centres, you know, so they're not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this yeah, one has yeah. a, there's no smoking policies around all of our centres just in, in keeping with the laws of. Well, I suppose my question is you wouldn't be, if, if, you, if you had, a, say, somebody who wanted to join and they drank and smoked, it wouldn't be an obstacle. Um, well, it isn't about. Um, some, it's about self You know, a membership of Opus Day isn't about. There are no saints on earth. Uh, yeah. Sanctity, holiness is a, it's a battle, it's a struggle um, that people engage in. We're there to help people with that struggle. And, yeah. um, uh, and you know, there's, uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a kind of um, a club of kind of, no, would, something like that. No, it's it's people who want to become saints, but we know that in this life, uh, you know, you just have to struggle for that, and mm. it'll be uphill all the way. And um, what Opus Day has helped a lot of people to do is to uh, get on that path and maybe recover lost ground or from, yeah. which is what yeah. what the Church and what Pope Francis especially is emphasizing. You know, the mercy of God, and. Um, I referred earlier to the Second Vatican Council. There's this lovely phrase about the church, which is 
sort of marching through history, clasping sinners to her bosom. You know, that's mm. that's the vision of the church. Pope Francis talks about smelling of sheep, you know. Um, mm. uh, so that's uh, so helping people to maybe pick themselves up if necessary. And all of that is all part of and parcel of, you know, spreading the gospel yeah. today and bringing yeah. them to Christ. I mean, Christ himself, when faced with sinners, you know, he was totally merciful and he set them on the right path and he was very encouraging. So it could only be like that, you know, it, it isn't a sort of a, an interview to kind of pass a test of virtue. Ah, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. You know? um, yeah. Do you drink and do you smoke? You know, the vision is somebody sitting down and being asked to answer the following questions. You know, <laughs> it's good. Cool. But there are people I've met so many. But actually, it's come something that comes to mind. Have you ever got any? What way would I put it? Stick, um, adverse comments to you about Opus Day. You know, have people said to you like, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something like, what are you with that cloud for, or what? You know, what, what does it mean? And they're really not interested. It's like, I wear a pioneer pin, right? Why I wear it is really for spite, I suppose, when it annoys people when they see a pioneer pin, you know, and, oh, you don't drink. And it must be, it must be very boring, you know. And or, a bit, I love, or a bit there. Yeah, I love, I, love, uh, I, love contra- I love a controversy like that. I do personally with the pioneer pin. But <clears throat> have you ever, have you met people that said to you like, What's this Opus Day crowd? You know, uh, as I said, they're a secret society and you go around all day on your knees or, you know, what do you do, you know? <clears throat> so what, have you ever gotten much stick about it? Um, well, I, I suppose personally, I can remember conversations uh, somewhat like that years ago. I think nowadays what tends to happen more is uh, like somebody might ask me if, I, if I'm married or if I have children and I explain that I haven't and, and why. And that actually opens up a very interesting conversation. I think when you share with people your outlook on life, um, even if, as you say, sometimes it might be a countercultural or a bit against the grain, you actually engage people in a way that you get a lot of respect. And that's even, that's, that's even from people coming from a totally different perspective. Um, and I can say that amongst my friends are people who, you know, they don't um, agree with the church or, or that, but they, you know, they see where I'm coming from and, and they're happy to engage. And so it, it isn't um, a, a, a polemical approach. And we would, I suppose, if I was to say, certainly my understanding is we would, are not out there to have fights with people because, you know, you don't win fights in the sense of, Mm. Now, that doesn't mean I won't make a point or defend yeah, yeah, yeah. the position, um, but um, you could say that um, the church is experiencing um, that a lot more, and a member of Opus Dei would, would feel very close to the heart about our, the, you know, the church and the difficulties the church is going through. Um, and the need to um, obviously to understand why those difficulties have arisen. Uh, and then to try and help people come back to the basics that, the, you know, the church is there for the salvation of souls. And it's made up of sinners like ourselves. Uh, and the important thing for people is not to is to try to make that connection with Jesus Christ in, in prayer and in the sacraments and in their everyday life. So it might be more in the broader context that you would find you're discussing um, opposition or criticism uh you know in 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 ireland today let's say um, um you mentioned that pat about being a sinner and there's a, I, I don't know if it's a myth or not but there is a a, a belief surrounding uh up state that sometimes as a reminder that they're a sinner that they wear chains or some sort of uh but, yeah yeah but, uh, yeah 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 um, well, some members of Opus Dei use traditional means of mortification that are in the church. And yeah. the idea, in a sense, is, is um, to reflect on our Lord's passion. And, uh, yeah. and it's, believe me, it's very analogous. Uh, it's in no way comparable to what our Lord suffered, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a... Um, but, um, you know, the idea of small, everyday 
mortifications, um, starting with what St. Jose Maria calls uh, the heroic minute in the morning, you know, getting out of bed at the right time and not, not, not being around. Uh, the small. Uh, That's my problem, getting out of the bed. <laughs> Something I can offer up, you know. Think of the heroic minutes, Tony. Um, actually, uh, in Saint Josemaria's book, The Way, uh, there's a chapter on mortification. Yeah. Mm. There's a lovely point where he talks about the butter tragedy. The what? And the butter tragedy uh, mm. actually comes from Father Willie Doyle. And Saint Josemaria had read the. Alfred Arahley biography of Father Willie Doyle, who was a yeah. First World War uh, army chaplain. He was a general. Yeah. And he kept a diary uh, while he was at the front. And he would be noting in it, um, today I did have butter, to the, or another day I didn't. Yeah. He was to, even amidst the privations of the trenches, he was trying to offer to God not having butter some of the days out of his ration. Yeah. Uh, and St. Josemarie loved that. Uh, when he read it and he, he brought it into that point in the way uh, the butter tragedy so I suppose uh, we think of you know the sugar and the tea or things like yeah, that yeah 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 and um, that and in Opus Day a lot of uh, mortification is encouraged like, in terms of your work you know try to uh, be punctual and do your job well and um, and especially nowadays as well like, take care of the, any ethical concerns that you might have or issues that come up you know more and more in the workplace uh, yeah. but that uh, you find to loads of scope or you know a parent with screaming children or not to get annoyed or to you know yeah. handle annoyance uh, so there's loads of scope in everyone's life and you know in the gospel we're told our lord tells us you know uh, if you want to follow me, you know, take up your cross every day. And so, yeah. so Rosemary had the idea of, of the unspectacular cross, you know, the small, yeah. uh, what he called the pinpricks of every day, the little things. Uh, and there are so many. Well, is, there phys is there also a physical modification, you know, where you can wear something just to remind you that you're, you know, of, of, of the of our suffering? Yeah. yeah, there is, yeah. Uh, and like many of the saints have done, you know, they, uh, yeah. they use mortifications like that. So, but um, everybody has plenty of opportunity in their every day yeah. to offer little things that are, uh, and then some people get big crosses. Uh, we just buried uh, a few weeks ago, one of our members, he was a young man of uh, 56 years of age. Uh, he had cancer for 18 years. Uh, for the last six years, he was eating, feeding artificially. He was involved in our youth activities when his health allowed it, um, and uh, he, you know, he and he he was so. Um, I suppose you could see great holiness breaking out when he when he was afflicted with this because he never complained and he he was yeah. in really, and you see that uh, some of our elderly members as well. Uh, our um, married members who are, you know, now in their 80s and 90s, they, they're just wonderful people to, to deal with because they're so trying to unite their old age and their sufferings. Uh, yeah. Christ and it's, I, I think people of that, I think people of that generation were more stoical anyway, you know, in their, you know, they, were, they took things on, like they were, I suppose they grew up uh, suffering and continued on, you know, and they're grateful for what they, what they had in later life, you know. Um, we, we, you can see it in younger people, a number of um, our causes of canonization. And uh, one of them relates to Montserrat Grasses. She was um, an 18 year old uh, girl and uh, she got cancer in her leg. Uh, and just, and in the church generally, there's been a, Pope Francis has beatified. You had the likes of uh, Blessed Carlo Acutis, who was beatified in Assisi last summer. Or last, last October, I think, and uh, he again was, uh, uh, you know, he died of um, an ill. I think it was cancer, but he he was mm -hmm. promoting um, devotion to the Eucharist in on yeah. the internet, uh, and uh, is lovely example of holiness in in adverse circumstances. And perhaps it mm -hmm. was his illness that brought him close to God at the end of it all. Um, 
But anyway, it's a wonderful example, and there are many examples amongst young people. Um, yeah. Just to kind of come back on that about the, it's not just that the older generation had the faith, which they did, uh, but um, young people are searching for this actually, um, mm -hmm. because the current the message that God doesn't matter or doesn't exist isn't satisfying at all. Uh, yeah. and as I mentioned earlier, Pope Benedict said it robs them of the potential to be great. You know, the greatness that's available to them. So there, it's, it's, I think it's, they, it's, it's easy, yeah. I think they say it's, it's easier route to believe than not to believe, I suppose, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, like what amazed me the night you gave us the lecture was I thought Opus Day was an old, very old uh, structure within the church, if you want to a better word. And I was surprised when you said it was only 1928. I thought it was going back centuries, you know, uh, as part of the church. I, I didn't realize. That was only a recent relative, it's not even a hundred years, which is recent in the church history. Oh, indeed, you know. oh, indeed, yeah. 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 There, there's a few things before we've only about 10 minutes left, just to ask you. First of all, we can't let this go without mentioning it. I have to get this right now. The Bishop of Lismore and Waterford, because Fancy didn't agree with me. I said the Bishop of Waterford first, and I forgot the Lismore bit, you know, and he said, make sure you get that in. But Fancy, I know, was a, a great. What word would I use? Believer, I suppose, really is the best thing, in Opus Dei. And I did ask him about that at the end of our talk, uh, and he said that um, he did, and he was on about St. Tots of Maria and that, you know. But uh, he just comes to mind now. But what is your opinion on uh, the state of the church in Ireland today? Like, for example, there are certain radio stations that I personally think, now this is my view, that are anti-church, right? Catholicism has been kind of wiped out. It seems to be not fashionable now to be a member of, of the, the, the Catholic Church. It gets a terrible lot of stick. And how do you get young people? Because they're not, to me, they're not being educated in the schools anymore. I don't think so, you know, about what I was told about the school, you know, about faith. And then you get people that are, the one that really irks me is somebody is anti-church, doesn't believe in anything he says, he thinks, I should say. And he wants to be buried in consecrated grounds. I can't figure that one out. You know, and why. So what do you think of the whole thing of the church and what's going to happen in the future? Um, well, what comes to mind, uh, our, our prelate was commenting on that recently in one of his meetings with people in, in uh, August, in July, I think. And he mentioned that sometimes it looks like we're going backwards in the church. But it's just a call to more responsibility on our part, not because we're better or we're going to solve everything, because, you know, it's way beyond any one person's individual capacity, you know, to, uh, to you know, solve all the problems that, that are there. But we, we, what we have to do is throw in our grain of sand. Um, so to pray is the first thing, always. Uh, pray for the church, pray for Pope Francis, as we have a duty to do as Catholics. Uh, and then to pray for the Bishop of our diocese as well, uh, which is also, you know, it's incorporated into the, the text of the Mass to do that. Um, and to pray for all, uh, everybody, uh, eventually, you know, that, uh, so you, prayer is the first thing. And then I was, we were talking earlier about mortification and sacrifice to offer that little things up for, uh, you know, Pope Francis going on a trip to Hungary now shortly, you know, we can offer up little sacrifices for that. Um, and it, some years back, I think it was in the 1980s, uh, St. John Paul II was making a trip to Holland. And he met uh, Blessed Alvaro del Portillo, who was the head of Opus Dei at the time. And, you know, he said, you know, what are you doing to get my, you know, how am I going to be received in Holland? Because Holland was, uh, you know, very, going through very um, liberal some would say anti-Catholic phase at that time. And John Paul II was walking right into it, you know, um, and he was asking Bless Oliver, you know, have you, what can you do to help or what can Opus Dei do to help? And, and Bless Oliver said to him, well, Holy Father, um, we're, uh, we're going to pray that the trip is a success. Uh, I've asked everyone to say the rosary, offer up the Mass and Holy Communion for your trip. There are some people who are very sick and are dying. We've asked them to offer that up for the success of your trip. So, um, and the first step always in these, in answer to the crisis of our times is 
is a, a sort of a spiritual supernatural response, which is within everyone's reach to do. Um, after that, it's a question of, um, well, trying to um, show that, well, we're, we're deriving, you know, our life is built around Jesus Christ and, uh, and therefore the sacraments and prayer and offering all we do and being, if you like, a lot of people might uh, be against church because they don't really see what it looks like. You know, they don't see maybe a good example of Christian living. They don't see. Uh, and we have to, you know, we have a responsibility to be Christ for other people, to go, as Pope Francis says, go to the peripheries where he's not there. But, and then, but he says an interesting thing, Pope Francis, when you go to the peripheries, you find Christ there. Because, of course, we can find Christ in other people. We can, um, you know, by, uh, you know, putting, uh, as St. John of the Cross used to say, you know, put love and you'll get it back, you know, where there is no love, you know, put it there. Or St. Francis, you know, where there's no understanding, show understanding and you'll get it back. So that's a, that's a mission that's there and it's on our own doorstep, as you say, uh, in these times. And you mentioned... Uh, Bishop Alphonsus, he has a wonderful um, initiative in the Dice as the Holy Family Mission. And yeah. he has developed that since he became bishop. And young people are going there, and it was featured on uh, RTE um, Nation uh, there on Good Friday. You know, so um, everybody can, you know, put in their, uh, put their shoulder to the wheel and do whatever they can. I mentioned... Uh, the Fathers and Son Club and the Family Enrichment. And we have another activity for Teenagers Horizon. Um, mm. And you find that uh, when you try to, anyway, to, you know, when you are uh, uh, sharing Christ with people and uh, trying to practice virtue and trying to help them as well, that there's a great openness for that, a great hunger for that uh, underneath all the, what might be happening on the surface. And, um, uh, so that's, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's... I know there's, you can't answer that, but I, one, another one that just fascinates all about me, I suppose, now, but I suppose another thing that, that fascinates me, that I'm amazed at really, that how is the mass being allowed on the television in the mornings during the lockdown from half past 10 to 11? I'm amazed that there are certain groups that have objected to this. You know, which I watch. Well, really, I suppose I love to know where it's coming from and what church do I know the church is coming from, you know. But I am totally amazed. Things like the removing of, of, of cribs from churches or from, from hospitals. Um, oh, there's so many things that, you know, the Angelus had barely survived, you know, at 12 o'clock in, in the daytime. And uh, it's kind of 6 o'clock, you know, and <clears throat> I mean, I don't know. You get depressed sometimes when you think about it. You know, that what is going to happen? I don't know. Well, I, I think you, Tony, that you've hit the, like the media, we're all certain media. Like the media is not, the, you know, they say they're, they're only leading what the people think. But the media drive, like, you know, even for, like, I was listening to yeah. a program recently and they were talking about why don't the church hand up its land to, uh, for housing? Like, I mean, like uh, you know, it's like uh, as if you're in Russia, where you can just take land off people, or you know. Yeah. Now, the Safran language recently saying that the state should have first call on the land, like you know. But I mean, you know, uh, and I think during the whole, you know, the the, the same sex marriage and the abortion referendum, a lot, a lot. You see, it was kind of the church against the people. They were, you know. Uh -huh. You know, and uh, there was people who weren't in the church who were like on one side or the other, like so. Uh, and then if the whole abuse thing, like if you if you talk to young people and some old people, oh, I don't go to mass anymore. I wouldn't go to church because of you know. And uh, so, and I think Pat is right that a lot of people who are saying you know condemning the church as a body, they don't see the good work that's been done by you know no. we are priests. No. Yeah. No. yeah. No, that's, yeah. that's forgotten about, you know. It's like the old saying, eating bread is soon forgotten, you know. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and a lot, of, a lot of people in the media who are criticising the church were educated by religious institutions, you know. Yeah. Not been told, no, not, not, no, no. not been told in the schools. I, I believe that myself, you know. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, Patty, you know yourself, you can ask children now, which I did only, only on Thursday, I, I really surprised me. I asked this individual, something came up with the church, and I said to him, can you say the memorare for me? <laughs> he rattled it off. He said he left the country school, and he was able to, he was able to rattle it off for me, you know. But I don't know, the whole thing, it's, it's depressing. I mean, I heard a, a, I heard a nice story from somebody who was working in a financial institution, and he... Um, he had a boss, a, a, a woman who was pretty self-proclaimed atheist, I suppose, you know, whether that's theoretically true or not, I don't know. But um, her father, at one stage she told him her father was dying and he gave her um, a rosary beads uh, from Medjugorje, actually. And um, and she took it and he said, give, give that to your father, you know, and... She brought it to him and she came back to him later and said, um, you know, I, I don't believe myself, but my father was delighted to get those beads. And then at some time later, the man died and she told him and we placed them, you know, in the coffin on his on his hands, you know. And so you could say that's reaching out to, and uh, you know, there's so much that can be done on the personal individual basis where that's true. Yeah. Respect, yeah. respect for the church and love for Jesus Christ ultimately will come back i mean the reasons we're seeing what we're seeing is that huge masses of people are are in that situation you're describing um where they're alienated and but it's it's a it's always the way i suppose the church had opposition or found it found the culture difficult from the word go i i think uh, and if you take a broader view of irish history i mean it was it was condensed enough the the, the religious fervor uh at least this is one perspective on, on it, um, that the, the piety that we experienced, let's say in the, the 50s or something like that was, was quite unique in the broader uh, sway. Of, I mean, one of the, the tasks Archbishop Cullen tried to reintroduce was precisely to restore piety and devotion because it had a lot of it had been lost. Um, that's not to say, I mean, we know of the heroism of our, our um, ancestors um, during um, the penal law times and that. And uh, in a sense, uh, there's a call today for a heroism, but it might be as it might be lived out in a different way um, where, you know, to actually say that you're going to mass around the coffee table at work on Monday morning might be yeah. Yeah. Less price, you know, but there are ways to um, there are ways to do that very naturally uh, that can encourage others and be openers to talk about well, why why do you go to mass i, I when, when you were talking about um the attendance of mass earlier there I, I was there was a funny one of these funny memes going around on whatsapp and it was um the reasons i don't go to mass and then mass was crossed out and have a shower w was put in you know <laughs> you know i find it boring um uh uh, I can't remember them all now, but it was quite funny that you could put the yeah. same reasons for a lot of ordinary things people do. Yeah, yeah. Um, part of the reason, of course, is that um, you know there's a great need to explain the mass and the understanding of it, what that it's our Lord's sacrifice on Calvary. Uh, something kind of different now, Pat, is coming to mind, uh, which I often watch, believe it or not. Canon Fulton Sheehan, do you remember him from uh, an American uh, uh, bishop, wasn't he? Bishop Fulton Sheehan. And, uh, and when you've seen him in that time, he gives these sermons and he jumps about, you know, when he's explaining the church. But he's, he's fabulous to watch, you know, the way he, he explains. Have we seen him, Pat? The way he. Oh, but I've seen videos and he was in uh, White Fire Street. Street. He was in White Fire Street in Dublin in the Carmelites. Uh, yeah. On a tour, yeah, he spoke yeah. spoke there, and there were huge crowds to see him. Yeah, because he's a uh, he's a uh, on WTN. I see him, you know, and he's now, his cause. I think his cause is well underway of beatification. I'm not. Yeah. He, may, he may already. I'm sorry, I don't know up to date, but he may he's already. A, be he's a great showman as far as I'm concerned. You know the way he used to explain himself and he march around. You know, and 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 swing his talk around. You know, but uh, I know he just comes to mind there. Don't we? We were talking about the church, uh, which I watch on on WTN. Have some very some very good documentaries sometimes, which I, I watch. And uh, now that there's one or two of them, they'll get me down. You know, uh, there's one or two I can't stick it on. Last thing that I want to ask you about: I have a problem with folk masses, right? I don't agree with them. 
learning to jump. I was, uh, uh, I said this the other night to a group, Tom was there, at, they were laughing when I told them I was a boy soprano into the, <laughs> into the redemptive choir. And we sang hymns that were good hymns. And they've all been pushed aside for, I don't like this modernism. I would ban guitars from the church if I had my way. Yeah. That's just for another day now. But you cannot beat but I mean beat in the sense of, of, of the organ in the church, you know, and the hymns that we sang, and which I still obviously remember to this day. But it's a pity that we've gone too kind of folky about uh, about the. I know it's it's it was a push to get young people involved, but I never I never took to it. If any any opinion, or would you rather stay out of this? <laughs> Yeah, I suppose um, rather stay out of it would be. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand your point, um, yeah. and um, I think the key thing about the liturgy always is uh, reverence. And um, one of the, the the great things we learned from our founder was reverence for the liturgy. And he used to see our oratories in our centres. He liked to describe them as Bethany, where. Our Lord would be happy there and we'd be happy there with him and um, praying, talking to him. And um, so he was very much in favor of good taste and beauty in the liturgy. And um, uh, and that's um, that's the kind of, I suppose, um, that's what you'll experience when you come to a center of Opus Dei in terms of yeah. the oratory and the liturgy and things will be done with reverence. Uh, in accordance, uh, obviously, in accordance with whatever the church uh, permits and, and uh, commands. Uh, what do you think, Tom, of, 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 of that? Would you agree with folk masses? Or? Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, uh, I was at a, at a mass one day and they sang Let It Be by the Beatles. Like, and it's, about, like, it's about drugs. And they think because Mother Mary is in it, that they're, uh, Mary, that, yeah, that it's, yeah. it's, it, you know, uh, like, that's just one example. I mean, I heard up in Ennis Diamond where the priest Ben singing at, at weddings because they sang Help Me Make It Through the Night. And as, as Pat says, it's about reverence, you know, like, you know, you can have music without trying to make it, uh, or even say, like, maybe it's just a person thing. People singing the old men uh, at their father's funeral. I, I don't, uh, like, well, some, some diocese now, I think the Archdiocese of Dublin, Certainly yeah. under, under Archbishop Martin certainly introduced guidelines for funerals. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I I remember think... one day I remember one day paying a visit to the Pro Cathedral. Yeah. I just wanted to do a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, but there was um they were preparing for a funeral that was going to happen, you know, half an hour or an hour later. And some musicians came in and the sacristan was out talking to them, and I overheard them yeah. going, you know, he was they had their playlist, so to speak, and he said, oh, Yeah. That's not that's not suitable. That's not permitted. You know, that, so there is an effort um, with guidelines for funerals to, insofar as without sort of making a big confrontation about it, to try and channel people towards uh, more reverent music um, for the occasion. You know, and um, yeah. Well, uh, I think I'll tell you a funny, see, one. Yeah. Tell you a funny one if I may. Uh, I yeah. a, a case of. Um, now, it was strictly speaking, it wasn't within the mass. It was as the, the coffin was being uh, brought out of yeah. the church, you know. So the mass had finished and, and the procession out of the church. But the deceased, obviously, was a, a fan of Johnny Cash. Yeah. Uh, the family decided to play the Ring of Fire. You know? <laughs> yeah. you know, down, down, down in the Ring of Fire, you know, the further down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, they could have picked sometimes stay, people, away to heaven, stay away to heaven be a better one. Well, yeah. sometimes people actually need guidance. On yeah. they don't see yeah. maybe the implications, and they might, you know, just make make a, a solemn occasion a little bit corny. Or, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, there are guidelines now in a lot of dioceses about that. Yeah. yeah. Before we finish, I got I have a book which I got from a priest. It's a very thick book on rules that the late Jeremiah Newman had done for the diocese of Limerick. And to read the rules that he not rules, he just set down these guidelines. I tell you, they were never followed. Because you can open, I've often opened it at pages as regards funerals, you know. And I tell you the whole thing, I'd love to bring it back and, and read it out in a church, you know. The whole thing, baptisms, he's all various uh, sacraments he's covered in this. And it's interesting to read. 
And but luckily, I never knew this book even existed. So this priest gave it to me. It was given to the church to the the the, the each church would say. But I tell you, the rules were never followed in it. I, I say it was never even read. You know, because yeah. it's crazy. These things happen. Well, I won't. Know? I won't speak badly about Bishop Jeremiah. He was the the Bishop of Limerick when we started here, and he was very welcoming and accommodating. Yeah. Yeah. So may God rest him. Yeah. Well, I think Bishop, I think Bishop Jeremiah Newman is a bit like the church. He was often maligned for wrong reasons. Like, you know, way very right. much maligned, you know, for things which are completely yeah. true. A lot of yeah. He was a very learned yeah. man. He wrote a lot of books. And, he yeah. was. And uh, I knew him, I'm proud to say, and he was, I found him a nice man, you know. Yeah. And I, knew, and, uh, now, I used to back off sometimes because I was afraid in case he'd, 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 he'd get annoyed at me. We questioned St. Bridges one time now, and I, I backed off, you know, and uh, I said to him, one thing I did say, you're joking me, I said, the Holy Wells, I said, were there before St. Bridges. Mm. The, the cross is there even before St. Bridges. And I said, you've got to tell me now that the cloak was spread out over Kildare. I said, you know, forget about it, I said, you know. And he, he said to me, you have to have faith, he said. <laughs> I said, we'll leave it at that. Pat, yeah, we'll yeah. leave it at this. We've gone way over time. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you. Myself and Tom Donovan, on behalf of the Limerick Islamic Society, and uh, we'll have to come back another time and talk about all the rights and wrongs and rules of the church and should people be banned from. from do you know what I would have? I maintain this is cause controversy. If somebody dies in the locality, I maintain they shouldn't be buried in, in they should be sent back to their own place where they come from because mm -hmm. we'd have plenty of room then in the graveyards for local people to be buried that they wouldn't be filling up so much. Why should somebody come from Donegal and be buried in Limerick? He should be sent back to Donegal. I can say that as a Limerick person, you know. Anyway, I think I think we've said enough for Carson without Carson more trouble. Pat, thanks to Tom and Pat. thank you Pat as well. And thanks, I hope Pat. I hope you enjoyed it. We we weren't very what let's say disrespectful or anything. Okay. Thank Good you. Right.